All right, folks, uh, I guess we'll, uh, we'll get started with the next uh, part of our program today. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be back, and we're going to experiment with a different means of writing that hopefully is a little bit easier uh, to share with you all uh, this time around. Uh, so we're going to continue in our discussion of uh, sort of topics right at the intersection of geometry and machine learning. Um, notice that when we talk about geometry and machine learning uh, from the perspective of most of the talks that I'll be giving here at, at the Machine Learning Summer School, uh, we haven't actually drawn any 3D shapes, right? These are all uh, talking about geometry of the data that you have embedded in some high dimensional space. Or in this case, we'll be talking about the geometry of the unknown uh, variables that appear in a lot of machine learning problems. So to get started uh, for our next uh, uh, talk for today, uh, first of all, many of you requested having access to slides. Uh, so I have a link here. This has the, a link to the slides both from yesterday and today. Uh, eventually, it'll have a link to my slides for tomorrow, but I have to prepare those first. Um, in addition to that, uh, yesterday we had a little bit of trouble with the whiteboard. We're going to use an iPad today, but just in case, yesterday night I also wrote out all of the math that I thought we would do today. And there's a PDF uh, inside of this folder uh, where, where it's all written down. Um, so we have a backup plan here. Uh, uh, I apologize, it was the best I could do in my hotel room with an iPhone, uh, but I think, it's, I think it's legible. Okay. By the way, hopefully, do you guys have access? Like, you, the link works? Yeah? Okay. Excellent. So, already in Marco's talks uh, yesterday and today, uh, we've seen sort of an interesting set of problems uh, that involve optimization, right? So, um, in a lot of the problems that Marco talked about, especially toward the end of his talk uh, this morning, the variable in the optimization problem that he was trying to compute was not just a vector of numbers, right? It was, in his particular case, a histogram, right? And, of course, a histogram has particular properties, right? So if you want to do things like compute the wasserstein berry Center, um, the wasserstein berry Center is a vector of numbers that is positive and sums to one. Right? And this is a very typical scenario in machine learning context, that the unknown variable in our machine learning problem isn't just a set of numbers, but it has some nice structure to it. And that's essentially what we're going to spend our time talking about this morning, uh, is optimization problems, which are everywhere in machine learning, where the variable isn't just a vector in Euclidean space, but rather has some additional structure. And this appears everywhere. So very commonly in machine learning, right, I, I think the most common approach in learning, whether you're using TensorFlow and, uh, you know, those deep learning tools or something more classical, SVM, what have you, all of these tools involve writing down some optimization problem, right? Typically, you write down some loss, whatever your, your loss is for your problem. Pardon me. And um, you minimize it over some set of variables, right? Some constraint set. And the constraint set, uh, today, uh, we'll use the, the letter uh, capital M to refer to that. And the typical constraints that we have in machine learning often are very structured in nature. Right? And so the, uh, the types of constraint sets that we have, you know, sometimes it's as simple as just being a vector of unknown. So for example, in the support vector machine, maybe you're you know, searching for the separating hyperplane and, and this is parameterized by a normal vector and a point. But oftentimes we see very common constraints that are common a lot of, uh, across many different applications. So for instance, maybe we optimize over unit vectors. A very common scenario is to optimize over the Stiefel manifold. Just out of curiosity, do you, have people ever heard this term before? It's okay if you haven't. Yeah, so the Stiefel manifold is the set of k orthogonal vectors in Rn, right? So th 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 that's a set of k by n matrices or n by k matrices with the property that the columns are orthogonal to each other, right? So for instance, in problems where you're trying to compute a basis for some space, which is a pretty common one, the Stiefel manifold tends to appear. There's a similar manifold known as the Grassmann, uh, the Grassmann manifold, which is of uh, linear subspaces. And then there are other spaces that appear quite a bit in computer vision, right? So for instance, in computer vision, it's very common to have to search for the motion or the position of a camera. And, and how do you typically do that? Well, you have to figure out the location of the camera, 
as well as the direction that the camera is pointing, right? And that direction um, maybe is a rotation, and the space of rotations is this group called the uh, rotation group SON, right? which you might have, have seen, uh, seen by uh, the you know, three by three orthogonal matrices and so on. And so what's a very common kind of scenario is you, you set up your favorite loss function, you have variables in some crazy space, and you try to optimize. You know, you cross your fingers, you call FMAN and MATLAB, or your stochastic gradient descent, or what have you, uh, and hopefully what comes out is a useful solution to your problem. Uh, and this is a very common uh, uh, scenario to be in. So for instance, uh, in structure for motion and computer vision, right, maybe your task is that you have many different views of a 3D scene, and you're trying to register them from one to another. And so in this case, maybe, you know, I have different uh, rotations of this 3D model, and I'm trying to synchronize them with each other. So between every two views of this bus, I have some camera motion that I think takes me from one view to the other, but they don't, they're not consistent with one another. So if I go from pose A to pose B to pose C, back to pose A with the estimates that I have, maybe I don't get the identity matrix. So in, in structure for motion, I want to take all of these different kind of erroneous uh, uh, measurements of relative motion and put them all together into one uh, coherent view of the world. Um, a similar uh, problem that appears in um, electron microscopy is something called cryo-EM. This is cryo-electron microscopy. This is kind of a trendy problem, especially numerical analysis. So in, 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 in cryo-EM, um, if you have the electron microscope, you know, it's I'm a mathematician, I don't really know what an electron microscope looks like, but in my mind it's like this very complicated device. I actually, I visited one a couple years ago and it, it looked extremely complicated to me. Um, but essentially, you have some protein that you're trying to image, right? And, and proteins, they can have extremely complicated structure. And so what do I do? Uh, well, if I'm very lucky, maybe the protein crystallizes, and, and that's how we were able to image things like DNA, by essentially you know, crystallizing it into a regular structure that maybe I can view at a larger scale. But some proteins, that just doesn't happen. And so in the cryo-EM problem, you take a sample of some molecule you're trying to image, and you freeze it into a very thin sheet of ice. So you freeze a sample of this thing, and you literally you take a razor and you shave a little piece off the top, and you put that into the electron microscope, and what you get is an image that looks something like uh, image A here, which is a little bit depressing. To me, it just looks like white noise. So I think the, uh, the signal to noise ratio here is like 0.1%, like it's extremely small. Um, but hiding inside of there, right, there are these little molecules that are floating around. Well, they're actually quite large molecules. They're proteins and things. Um, projected into the plane of the microscope. Right? So in the cryo-EM problem, you have extremely noisy images of a molecule whose shape you don't know, and you don't know where the camera was because you have no control over the orientation of the molecule as it floats through the, the liquid and gets frozen. Right? And so your task is to reconstruct the 3D shape, but you don't even know where the camera was, and your noise looks something like the left-hand side. It's really amazing that people can do this. It requires a huge amount of data where they take a giant sample of these molecules and they just image it thousands and thousands of times. Um, to, 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 to put together. Now, one of the interesting takeaways from the cryo-EM literature in applied math is that the set of variables for this problem is quite complicated. On the one hand, you have the shape of the molecule you're trying to reconstruct. On the other hand, you need to figure out where the camera was, right? Because you have this molecule that's just floating through this liquid, and then you freeze it, and you, you can't control what angle you were taking the image of this thing from. And so the cryo-EM problem, you have two variables, both of which are quite complicated. One is the shape, and the other is a rotation. And the space of rotations is what we'll be kind of worrying about today, right? So that's going to be like a weird optimization variable, because it's not a vector, right? It's, it's a very structured object, uh, and, and one that's hard to work with. And this context comes up all over the place, and other places in um, sensor networks. So, you know, maybe between every pair of sensors, you have some rough, rigid motion. Um, that kind of estimates, you know, the distance. There's, you know, you know the, a very common scenario would be uh, I have people walking around and uh, each one of them is carrying a cell phone. The cell phones call each other and so they have some rough estimate of the distance from my cell phone to my friend's cell phone and then the distance from their cell phone to all their friend's cell phone. And the localization problem, you know, my, my task is to 
try and place all of the cell phones on a map, right, based on these distance values. And the distance values themselves are, are quite noisy, but in addition to that, uh, there's a problem, which is if I take everybody, you know, I, I have my, my cell phone uh, location, I have Kenny's uh, cell phone and some other folks, and we all step 10 feet to the left, does the distance between our cell phones change? You're nodding, but no, it doesn't, right? We all moved the same distance, right? Uh, so the distance between the cell phones remains the same, right? So hiding inside of this optimization problem is the fact that our variable is not really positions in 2D or 3D, right? Because this whole equivalence class, uh, so, uh, this whole equivalence set of variables for our problem that are exactly the same, right? In other words, I can take a set of points, I can move them in a particular way, and the distances between those points don't change, right? And so really, somehow the space of variables for this problem isn't the set of points, it's the set of points modulo this, uh, this, this relationship that if I move them in a rigid fashion, the, their, their relative motions are the same. So anyway, these sorts of structures appear everywhere in machine learning and computer vision. And so we need to come up with nice approaches for how to solve these problems in practice. So how do we typically do this? Well, um, one thing we can do is uh, try to take our constraint space and write it in a, a nice, feasible mathematical way and, and try to optimize. So here, uh, let's say that I want to solve structure from motion. So in this case, the variable in my problem is probably a bunch of rotation matrices. This is very common in computer vision. Um, well, what is the uh, space of rotation matrices? Well, a very slick way to notate it is maybe to use this SO3 notation, but that's not particularly useful from a practical perspective, right? It's not clear what that means. So in practice, the set of rotation matrices is the set of three by three matrices, we'll call them R, with two properties, right? One is that the matrix transpose times itself is equal to the identity. Right? That's what I've written uh, in this, this first line here. So R transpose R is equal to identity. The second constraint, um, which distinguishes rotations from things that invert, is that the determinant of this three by three matrix R is equal to one. Right? So any three by three matrix that satisfies these two constraints is a rotation matrix that you might have seen in your vision or computer graphics class. And so if I'm trying to solve structure from motion, a very typical thing that I have to do is to solve an optimization problem with many constraints that look like what I've written in this slide. Does that make sense? So how easy or difficult do you think these kinds of optimization problems are in practice? Well, these are actually extremely difficult problems to solve, right? Because my variable is this matrix R. So what is my constraint? It is quadratic in the entries of R, right? I've taken R and multiplied it by itself uh, and, 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 and forced this to be the identity. So this is like a quadratic programming problem. To make matters actually more difficult, the determinant of a three by three matrix is actually cubic in the entries of the matrix. So these are very difficult constraints to satisfy. In fact, they cut out a really crazy non-convex set in the set of three by three uh, matrices. They're like degree two and three polynomials. There's some really nice visualizations of what the uh, space of rotations looks like. I encourage you to uh, take a look. So if you Google uh, this term Hopf coordinates, you'll see these kind of beautiful mathematical diagrams of the space of rotation matrices. This is a three-dimensional manifold, right? Because uh, you know, you might remember from airplane terminology that rotations are, are parameterized by roll, pitch, and yaw, or by Euler angles, or there are many different uh, terms here um, that roughly correspond to rotation this way, rotation this way, and I guess rotation that way, <laughs> and um, something like that. And uh, uh, because of that, it's, it's a very complicated space to, to work in. Right? And so a very typical thing, uh, these are extremely nonlinear constraints, so you put them into your you know, gradient descent, quadratic programming tool, you try to optimize. Sometimes you're lucky and it works out. Sometimes you get an infeasible point and it's not so clear what you should do, right? Because uh, even projecting, if I give you a three by three matrix and I say find the closest rotation matrix, that's not a totally trivial problem. It turns out that's solvable using SVD. Um, but there are many cases where, where, where this is just not possible. So how do we optimize for these things in practice? Well, um, a very typical thing, right? So 
let's generalize our problem slightly, right? So we have some objective function, f of x, and some constraint, g of x equals zero, right? So in our structure for motion, maybe f of x is encoding the motion between every pair of uh, images. And then g of x equals zero is encoding the fact that all of my matrices have to, uh, you know, when I multiply them by their transpose, I get identity. And when I take the determinant, um, I get one. Right? Those are, this can be written in, in this form here. And then I have sort of an abstract visualization of what that looks like. So I have my objective function f of x, right? And these concentric circles that are going from black to white here are, are sort of different level sets of my objective, right? So if f had its way and there were no constraints in my problem, what would be the optimal point? Uh, what would be the optimal solution? So I just say minimize f of x with no constraints at all. Let's make sure you understand this diagram. Can anybody point? <laughs> where, where is the uh, solution to this problem? There you go, he's got it right. Clearly he's pointing where I think he is, which is uh, right in the, the center of the, the, the gray circle here, right? Because if there are no constraints, if I'm not forced to pay attention to this g of x equals zero, right, then I might as well go right to the middle uh, of this, this uh, problem here. Where is my, my mouse? Uh, no, that's okay. But unfortunately I've added a constraint, right? I, I, I'm forcing myself to say on the set, where g of x equals zero. That's this red line on this slide here. And now the problem is a little more complicated, right? No longer can I uh, stay just on the, uh, uh, just uh, you know, try to aim right for the middle of our target, but rather I have to stay on this red set, and now I get somewhere uh, a little bit farther out, right? And notice that these two things are in conflict with each other. Obviously, right? Because if I didn't have a constraint, um, you know, I would get a different solution to my problem, right? So the, the constraint is actually doing something, yeah? And so in practice, when we optimize, you know, you look at, uh, you have some estimate for the solution of your problem, x, and you want to iteratively make it better, uh, what, what can you do? You can visualize the path that x might take in your optimization problem. And very typically, it looks something like this, right? Where I take some step down the gradient of f, that steps me off of my constraint, and then I have to do something to take me back, right? So it kind of zigzags back onto the constraint set, and then I step off of it again because F really wants to take me off of the constraint set, and then I have to project back, and back and forth, and back and forth. Is this a particularly efficient way to get to the minimum of F of X subject to G equals zero? No, right? I'm using a lot of computational work to step in a direction which is not useful for my optimization problem, right? Because the second that I step off of that g equals zero curve, that red curve, I have an infeasible solution to my problem. Like for instance, in structure for motion, I have a matrix that's no longer a rotation matrix. And that's no good, you yeah? uh, know? And so, essentially, uh, the question, and in fact, this picture is actually quite optimistic. Right? In the sense that when I stepped off of my manifold, when I stepped off of my constraints, rather, I was able to at least project back onto the constraints. Right? In other words, in every other step, I stepped down the gradient, and then I kind of jumped back onto the red curve. But in fact, even that projection problem of just find me the closest point on that red curve, you know, because I took a gradient step and I left my constraints, is oftentimes equally difficult to the original optimization problem. In other words, I may not even be able to solve this projection. In some cases I can, right? Like if it's a rotation matrix, then it turns out you, you can do it in closed form. But this is not always the case. So this is our motivation for today, that very, very commonly, especially in computer vision and, and also in some other problems like uh, graph matching, semi-definite programming, some other places, you have a very complicated constraint set. And uh, if you write down the sort of naive way of solving this problem, and just try to apply things like stochastic gradient descent, you can get a lot of trouble because essentially the gradient of your problem is in conflict with the gradient of your constraints. But at the same time, the types of constraints that we see are not so complicated. Right? They fall into certain categories, things like rotation matrices and orthogonal vectors or semi-definite matrices. And the question is, can we use special properties of those spaces to accelerate or improve the behavior of our optimization tool, okay? So today we're gonna to discuss a very different approach and perspective on this sort of problem. And this actually links to our discussion yesterday. 
So remember yesterday, we were talking about embedding problems. We had this Swiss roll data set, right, where you had a plane and it was kind of curled up on itself. I noticed at the hotel breakfast we had this morning, they had something kind of isomorphic to that. And I tried to take a photo, but it didn't work out. Um, but, but in any event, uh, remember there were two different words that we used to describe these embedding tools, right? They either were sensitive to extrinsic geometry, this is tools like PCA, MDS, and so on, or they were sensitive to intrinsic geometry. Right? So the intrinsic geometry of that Swiss roll was the fact that when you unroll it, it's a two-dimensional plane. So today, we're going to kind of continue that intrinsic perspective, and we're going to ask a question, which is, can we use the intrinsic geometry of the constraint set of our problem for optimization? So in other words, let's say that I attach a bead to that red curve, and I say that I just can't leave that curve. I just, there's no, uh, there's a universe where I just don't know how to leave that curve. Can I write down an optimization algorithm that looks like gradient descent, Right, looks like our favorite tool in machine learning, but just doesn't know how to leave the constraints. It couldn't if it wanted to. And that is going to lead to this manifold valued optimization tools, which is what we'll talk about today. And so the basic perspective we're gonna have here, usually this diagram, they have ants walking around on a Mobius strip, but I, I think that's kind of disgusting. Uh, but anyway, I found a Mario Kart driving instead. I thought that was better. Uh, so in, in any event, from Mario's perspective, drawing, driving along this crazy surface here, he doesn't have the option of stepping into the, the blue sky, right? All he can do is drive around on this crazy space. And, and he can still do some notion of gradient descent. Uh, and, and, and that's gonna be essentially what we're gonna do today, is this intrinsic version of gradient descent. Or actually, probably a better analogy here is let's say that I'm a ladybug and, and maybe I can smell I don't know, what do ladybugs look for? You know, the, the, the inside of a flower, you know, they, uh, presumably they want, you know, nectar or something. You know, and so there's some objective function, right, which is like, you know, they can smell their food and they're trying to walk toward it. But of course, the ladybug is walking along a curved surface, right? Leaves are actually, I think, slightly hyperbolic often, right? Something about the growth pattern. From the ladybug's perspective, is it solving a crazy constrained optimization problem? No, it's just walking down, you know, the gradient of its objective function, you know, looking at its feet, walking forward, and uh, trying to get closer to its food. And it doesn't know that it's walking along a curved space. Right? That's happening globally, but locally the, uh, the, the, the structure is exactly the same. Right? And so that's going to be our job today, is to write down algorithms that are simulating this ladybug and simply cannot leave the constraint set. But in this case, instead of having a leaf, we'll be talking about, you know, like the space of rotation matrices. Essentially the same thing. Okay, and that is really this intrinsic approach to optimization. That, um, you know, oftentimes we have variables that are on a sphere or something. And when we do gradient descent, one way to understand gradient descent is when I step along the gradient, I'm moving along a straight line. But there's nothing about that algorithm that says that you have to do that. And so that's going to be our approach today. Okay, so. Our starting point, as with almost any story in modern machine learning, is a particular formula that looks like this. How many of us have seen this formula before? I think many of you have, yeah. I noticed the front two rows do not want to participate, and I'm gonna change that. Especially over here, this side is okay. All right, so this is a, a very uh, famous uh, optimization algorithm. It's known as uh, gradient descent, right? So I have some function f, uh, in optimization, we call it a function. In, in machine learning, we call it a loss. Uh, I guess in online learning, you call it regret, which I always found kind of depressing. But in any event, um, I have some function f of x, and, and my task is to make f of x as small as possible. Right? When I do that, I win. And so in the gradient descent algorithm, I know that the gradient of my function f points in what direction? I see some like hand gestures going on. What direction is the gradient point in? I'm not gonna ask hard questions today. Yeah, it points uphill. By the way, there's always somebody that says it points in the direction of steepest descent. That's actually false, right? The gradient points uphill, so minus the gradient points downhill. And of course, that is exactly what the gradient descent algorithm is doing, right? It's computing the gradient, stepping a little bit downhill, recomputing and, and iterating. Okay? 
But somehow this is a Euclidean algorithm, right? It's depending on the fact that I can do things like add, subtract, and multiply vectors, right? In this case, the vectors being the position x, which is my current optimal point, um, and the, the gradient, right? But now you can kind of see what goes wrong, right? So remember our, our, our picture, right? So in this constrained problem, right, the gradient points off of my constraint set. So when I step in a straight line, I step off of the red curve because all I know how to do in gradient descent is walk along little line segments, okay? So the real question here is what are the constituent parts of gradient descent? In other words, what is making gradient descent work? So if we revisit this formula that we have, I would argue that there's sort of two key pieces here. This is a little bit goofy, but I think, I think it's nice to step back a, a bit and, and make sure that we really understand what's going on in, in the gradient descent machinery. And unsurprisingly, the two things that make gradient descent work are one, computing gradients, and two, doing descent. Yeah? And we can see that in the equation here, right? So we have the gradient of f, and we have a way to do descent, right? Namely, the subtraction, yeah? But unfortunately for our ladybug, right, these, uh, you, you can maybe compute a gradient, right? The ladybug can turn its toes around and find the direction that sort of looks like it's gonna walk downhill. But then, you know, unless your ladybug is riding a skateboard, it's gonna, it's gonna run into some trouble, right? If you take a straight line, it's gonna step off of the leaf and fall onto the ground. That's not so good. And so it's that descent piece is where we start to get into trouble. So today, we're gonna motivate algorithms that essentially look exactly the same as gradient descent, just dressed in, in fancy notation, right? So here, um, we're still going to be able to compute the gradient of a function, but we're gonna have to be careful that the gradient is going to keep me in the tangent plane to my function. So in other words, like, you know, if I'm the ladybug, I'm walking along the leaf, and I notice that, like, above my head, I can smell a better objective function, is there anything I can do about that? No, right? Like, I'm stuck, I'm constrained, you know, I guess ladybugs have wings, but th that aside, I, I, you know, I'm constrained to, to walk along the manifold itself, so somehow that direction is irrelevant, right? So the first thing that we're going to have to do is to find what does it mean to compute a gradient when I'm constrained to stay on a particular set. And then the second thing I'm going to have to do is do the descent part of gradient descent, and we're going to replace that with something called the exponential map, or more generally, an object called a retraction, uh, which is the sort of key object in this manifold value optimization world. And this is gonna be a useful tool in a lot of different contexts, not just like structure for motion, cryo-EM, but actually just recently, a lot of these sort of neural network tools and computer vision are beginning to incorporate these sort of, of ideas because many tasks in computer vision, the relevant output of your task is something like a camera motion, in which case using these sorts of tools makes a lot of sense, right? So it's not just like a fancy way to do optimization, it's sort of a nice way to enforce your constraints without having to do crazy things like projection, okay? And there are many different reasons why you might wanna do this. One is that oftentimes there are more efficient algorithms for uh, optimization with these uh, constraints. Remember in our example, we already saw that if you kind of step and project, step and project, it's not terribly efficient, right? You're spending a lot of computational work stepping away from the constraint that you care about. And then from a theoretical perspective, we'll see that there's some really elegant things that, that we can prove about these techniques, right? That we can talk about the same that we know lots of things about convergence of gradient descent. We can take that type of math and just drop it right into this manifold value case almost without change and prove some, some really nice properties for a much wider class of techniques. And this is quite nice because often it's quite difficult to prove things about constrained optimization algorithms. So this is a nice case. So today we're gonna to go through a very simple vocabulary language for how to understand these so that when you guys show up at Neurips ICML and see somebody talk about this stuff, you can kind of understand uh, you know, the basics of these algorithms. This is a very large and popular area in uh, both in machine learning and just in optimization world. Um, so I encourage you to dig into this kind of thing if you like it. Uh, there's a really nice textbook uh, by Abseil and company. Um, it's called uh, Optimization Algorithms on Matrix Manifolds. I know it's a really uh, intriguing title, uh, <laughs> but it actually is, uh, is quite the page turner, and I, I, I do uh, recommend you guys take a look. 
Um, there's also a very nice piece of software out there called Manopt. This stands for Manifold Optimization, um, which is built into MATLAB. I know there's also a uh, Python version and I think a Julia version out there, um, which implements many of the algorithms that we'll talk about. Um, this is really nice because essentially in Manopt, you just say my variable is in the set of rotation matrices and this is the gradient of my objective and it takes care of all of the crazy things that you have to do to make gradient descent work in this weird space um, in a totally transparent way. So you, you, you don't have to write all the crazy code that we'll talk about today. Um, and then finally, uh, one of the big uh, names uh, of people that work in this area is uh, my colleague Nicola Bumal. Um, he is in the process of finishing a book on, on exactly uh, this topic. Uh, he told me to advertise it to you guys today and that he promises that this book will be posted on his webpage by the end of like next week. <laughs> so the timing didn't quite work out, but it's, but it's close. Um, and I've seen a preliminary version. There, there is some really nice materials here. Okay. So our plan for today, uh, I thought for a few minutes we would talk very broadly about what a manifold is, um, what the world of differential geometry looks like, um, and, and sort of what this theory is all about, partially to get you ready to talk about manifold valued optimization, which is our topic of discussion for today, but also partially because this is just a popular language that appears in many different machine learning problems. And it's worth knowing a little bit about what people are talking about when they use all these fancy geometry buzzwords. So we'll, we'll, we'll spend a few minutes with a very high level pictorial kind of sketch of different theories of geometry. And then we'll dive into the mathematics of what does it mean to be a manifold? Like when I keep using this word, you know, SO3 is a manifold and then so on, we need to be careful. Like what is our enemy here? What is the, what is the actual object that we're working with? After that, we're going to go into some detail about what it takes to make gradient descent work in a manifold. That'll be our, our practical part. And then I've worked out two kind of full examples of uh, what this looks like in practice. So we'll do one for optimization for eigenvalues, so for problems like uh, principal component analysis. It turns out there are actually some fairly efficient algorithms for really classical tasks like eigenvalue computation, which are beginning to be revisited in the manifold optimization world. And then we'll talk about an optimization problem on the Stiefel manifold uh, as well, uh, which is useful for, for like principal component analysis. And then returning to the question that we had yesterday, we'll talk about some robust versions of PCA that are sort of equally easy to implement in the manifold setting that would be quite difficult to implement uh, in, in the sort of classical setup. And then finally, I'll highlight some interesting research papers and directions that you guys can look into if you're, you're curious about this field more broadly. Incidentally, if you're curious, this is not an area that I work in, so I actually spent the last week uh, kind of learning about this area and, and uh, uh, using it to teach it to you guys today. So I will attempt to have intelligent uh, answers to your questions, but there is a high probability of I don't know as an answer, although I'll try to hide it in you know, math language so you don't know. <laughs> okay, so we keep using the term manifold. And Hello? Oh, that's back on. So I keep using terms like manifold and differential geometry. So let's spend about 10 minutes just defining what these areas are to make sure that we're all on the same page. So I'm not sure uh, how many of you guys have taken a differential geometry course. I don't think that's a very typical class to take. This, this gentleman has, um, which is great. A few of you have, but I uh, certainly don't expect you to. Uh, but I do think that many of you have taken a geometry class at some point in your life, probably in high school. And of course, when you take geometry for the first time, you study Euclidean geometry, um, which looks an awful lot like this. First of all, it tends to be in Arabic uh, or maybe in Greek. Uh, but, but that aside, if we take a look at Euclid's elements or any of these famous old uh, things, there's something a little bit disappointing. <laughs> Right? I mean, essentially, when you take your first geometry class, it's all about learning how to prove theorems. It's a little bit less about geometry, right? In, in, in particular, I mean, what are the shapes that you study? I mean, they're things like triangles and circles. But unfortunately, in geometry, of course, the shapes that we really care about are bunnies. And this formalism does not really fit particularly well into using a straight edge and a compass, right? Like measuring straight lines and angles. <laughs> 
And so it turns out, despite what you might have learned in high school, that there was about you know, 500 years of development beyond uh, these early theories of geometry that are, are relevant to our everyday lives. And that is what begins to motivate the theory of differential geometry. And so uh, there, there are many different textbooks out there that are very famous in the area of differential geometry. I think Do Carmo is one. My favorite is this series of textbooks by Spivak. Has anybody encountered these books before? There's actually five textbooks, each of which is about 200, 300 pages worth of material in differential geometry. I don't think anybody's ever actually read them. Um, but uh, I, I really like the introduction of, of Spivak's textbook. He talks about he wants to write the great American differential geometry book. I have no idea what that means. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the, the, the nice thing about these books, they're written in the 1960s, and the textbooks have these like very kind of hippie cartoons with like Gauss and Binet being friends, and it's, it's very cute. But, but in any event, differential geometry is all about the study of smooth manifolds. So finally, let's determine, what is this, this term I keep using, manifold, right? So typically, if we think about geometry, you probably spend a lot of time learning about curves, right? You know, just things traced out in 2D or 3D. And the next thing that you learn about is a surface. Right? And a surface, like, uh, that's a surface right there. Uh, you know, this is outside of us, the surface as well. It has sort of this interesting structure, right? And so there's a surface on the screen, which is that a surface is sort of simultaneously in two and three dimensions. Right, it's sort of as if I take a magnifying glass, I get very, very close to it. It's sort of a two-dimensional object, right? It's like a two-dimensional slice through space. But of course, it's sitting in 3D. And that's sort of the basic idea of, of a manifold. It's an object that locally has some Euclidean structure, has some like D-dimensional structure. So like a surface would be a two-manifold. But maybe when I step further out, you know, maybe it's embedded in some higher dimensional space. And so that's the, the basic takeaway in you know, two sentences or less of, of what a manifold is. And so if you go about defining it, essentially a, a manifold, it could be something like this double torus, has this property that if I choose a point on my manifold, like what I've marked here, then there exists some neighborhood around that point so that locally it looks like Euclidean space, like RK. In other words, there exists some map from RK into that neighborhood that's smooth, bijective, well-behaved, all that good stuff. It doesn't have to exist globally, right? Like, it would be very difficult to take this double saurus and map it into the plane in an intelligent way, but just in small neighborhood around every single point. Okay, so we'll, we'll formalize that in a minute. Now, everything that I've drawn for you guys so far um, sort of goes back to theory by Gauss, right, on, on differential geometry of embedded surfaces. We use embedded, what we mean is that, of course, this double surface, this double torus is sitting inside of 3D, right? It's, it, and so somehow the geometry of this torus is inherited from the geometry of the space around it. But that's not always true. And so if you fast forward about 100 years, uh, there's another very famous mathematician by the name of Riemann, who had what in retrospect was kind of a, a, you know, a simple observation, but one that was really profound. Just let's take a look at a map of the, the world here. And, you know, we've all drawn maps, uh, I hope. <laughs> and, 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 of course, a map is itself a geometric object, right? It's a rectangle, right? In fact, it's like, what, about 10, 15 feet wide on our, our screen here. It has some number of meters, I have no idea. And, uh, you know, some number of meters tall. And, uh, but when we look at this thing, do we think of distances between, you know, what, Mexico and somewhere in Africa as being measured in meters? No, obviously not, right? Like these distances are in, in miles, as proper distances should be. Okay, and uh, so what was, what was Riemann's perspective? He said that I have this one object which is encapsulating the geometry, right? I have a rectangle, and when you guys look at this rectangle, you can see that the United States is closer to Mexico than it is to Africa or whatever. But there's two different geometries at play, right? There's the geometry of the rectangle, and then there's the geometry of the Earth, which is what the rectangle represents. Yeah? And to make matters even more complicated, here I took, notice that there's two line segments marked on this, uh, this map here. 
right? There's one between uh, Mexico and Africa and one from, I'm not even going to try because I'm going to get it wrong and, I don't, you know, we're somewhere over here as far as I can tell. Is the length, so how did I make this in PowerPoint? I took one of these two line segments, I hit control C, you know, I hit control V and I moved it somewhere else on the map. So what do I know? I know that on my computer screen, these are isometric, they are the same line segment. Are they the same line segment on the map of the Earth? No. And so that was Riemann's big observation, that we need to decouple connectivity, right? That's what this map is telling me. It's telling me what things are connected to what from the way that we measure distances, lengths, and angles. And moreover, the way that we measure distances, lengths, and angles can change from location to location, right? That like the way that we measure them in, in Mexico <laughs> is different from the way that we measure them in Russia from the perspective of this map. Hopefully from the perspective of, of uh, you know, mathematicians is the same, but that's a, a different matter. Okay, and so um, essentially Riemann noticed that this is a pattern that appears all over the place. To go back to an analogy that we've already discussed today, um, you know, let's say that I, I have two ants walking along a surface. Do the ants probably know that one of these surfaces is a sphere and one of them is hyperbolic? Just by like looking around? I mean, if the ant is really, really tiny relative to the geometry of the surface, probably not, right? It just looks flat. Yeah, like for instance, you know, if I walk outside of Skoltek, can I tell that the earth is round? Probably not. It's a, I have an internet community that tells me otherwise, yeah? But of course, um, I, you know, if I, if I walk far enough, maybe I notice that I end up back where I started and now I know that the Earth is no longer flat. I have to walk a long distance. And Riemann noticed that even locally, ants can measure this phenomenon, but it has to do that in a kind of a complicated way. So for instance, um, you, you know, maybe I don't have just one ant walking along my surface, but rather I have two. And moreover, you know, these ants are holding hands. They're friends. Yeah, and so they both, they stand right next to each other, they point their toes in the same direction, they hold hands, and they start walking forward. And then it turns out three things can happen, right? And that's happening on the screen here. That actually, what the ants will notice, maybe it's not the ant, maybe it's Evgeny, I grab his hand, we start walking together. And I tried. Um, is that actually, they'll start tugging against your hands, that's like the third case on the screen here. Or maybe you get closer together. And essentially, what we notice is that the ants can actually measure curvature just by walking together in circles or by holding hands. And that's sort of Riemann's perspective, that it turns out that you can measure things like curvature very locally by taking very small steps, but you have to do so in a very complicated fashion. Yeah. And so this is the basic perspective of Riemannian geometry, is that I'm an ant, so everything looks flat to me, but I can measure things like curvature by measuring local lengths and angles and noticing how they change as I walk along uh, my domain. Yeah? I encourage you to try this experiment. You know, get, take your closest friend and walk along a hill uh, outside. Okay, so that's the basic landscape of, of geometry, right? That, that no longer is Euclidean geometry going to be good enough for us today. We're going to talk about uh, manifolds, and in particular, the Riemannian perspective. And we're going to show that it's valuable for a lot of tasks in machine learning where your variable is something like a rotation or a set of orthogonal vectors. Okay, so now let's do a little bit of math. So first thing that we have to do is define what our enemy is, right? We have to figure out what the unknown is in our problem. And of course, I've drawn you some nice schematics involving ants and ladybugs and, you know, Mario Kart. Uh, but, but uh, uh, you know, one thing that's important is to maybe translate that into symbols. Uh, so let's, let's do that next. So in particular, let's start easy, which is, let's define a one-dimensional manifold, which is a curve. A little bit of a philosophical question here. What is a curve? It's a collection of points. That's exactly the right answer I was looking for. I hope you're not spying in my slides. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that's actually not the definition that you learn in calculus class, right? What you learn is that a curve is a function from t, right, time, to points in 3D. And that's a reasonable definition, but let's see where it can go wrong, right? So um, if we want to define a curve, maybe we think about it like a function. I think this is a pretty common thing to do, right? So like gamma of t. And of course, if I draw a schematic like this, life looks good, right? This looks correct. But let me give you a perfectly valid function of t. 
which is that gamma of t is zero. Is this a curve? Yes. I would say no. I would say this is a point. <laughs> yeah? Because as I vary t, I don't move anywhere, right? So if, it's a, if I'm looking for something that is intrinsically one-dimensional, I didn't find it, right? I found something zero-dimensional. And to make matters worse, let's take a look at these two functions, f1 and f of 2 of t. So f1 of t is just drawing a straight line in the plane. What is f2 of t doing? It's actually also drawing a straight line. It's just that at time one, Mario Kart hits on the accelerator, the car drives twice as fast but it's still drawing along the, uh, the same curve. Are these different curves? No, as geometric objects in the plane, they're the same. Right, so as a representation using a function, it's probably not the right way to encapsulate a piece of geometry. In fact, here's another example where, uh, if I'm talking about smooth curves, right, this is a set of smooth functions, but they map into a non-smooth set of points. Right? There's a cusp here. Okay. So anyway, I think I've belabored this point. And thankfully, our colleague here has exactly the right answer, which is that a curve is not a function, it's a set of points. It's a set of points in two dimensions, three dimensions, with a particular property, which is that if I zoom in really close to that set of points, it has a one-dimensional structure. Right? So how could we formalize that? Right? So again, we want that a set of points is something that locally looks like a line. So here's our definition in its full glory. I'm sorry, it's a little hard to read. I encourage you to glance onto one of your colleagues' screens if they have uh, loaded up the, uh, the slide on their computer here. So what is the definition of a curve? Well, it's a set of points, maybe in Rn, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's in the plane or not, with the property that for any point P, I can take a little neighborhood U around it. Hopefully you can see that on the screen. And in that neighborhood U, there exists a function gamma, so this is where function is okay, that maps into the curve. And in particular, gamma has the property that its derivative is never zero. It's like a car that can never stop, right? And what that gives me is that I can't have this case where my car stops and I just get a point. I can't get a cusp because in order to get a cusp in a differential way, I'd have to stop the car, turn the steering wheel, and then keep driving. Right? So this is our sort of hack for making sure that I have a differentiable curve. It's to say that my, my uh, parametrization, my function gamma, cannot have a derivative that vanish. Does that make sense? So the basic takeaway here is that a curve is a set of points, it's not a function, and around every point, there exists a function locally that maps into a neighborhood of that point with the property that its derivative never vanishes. So in other words, I can drive a car along it. Right? So the function would be like the position of the car as a function of time. And that's it. That's our first definition of a manifold, but of course it's one dimensional. And so our next task is to uh, talk about other dimensions, right? So it would be very difficult to drive a single car all along this triple torus here. Um, and so instead, uh, we have to be a little bit more complicated than that. In addition to that, we also have to deal with the fact that we need to find an analogy for this condition that the, the gradient never vanishes, right? That the derivative never goes to zero. My car can't stop. So in order to do that, of course, I have a function. I'm going to define its derivative or its differential. Hopefully you guys remember this from calculus class. We'll do this kind of slowly. Um, another term is the Jacobian matrix, right? So if I have a function from Rn into Rm, then the Jacobian matrix is just all of the possible ways I could differentiate it. Right, like the derivative of every output with respect to every input makes a matrix. Now in differential geometry, we tend to prefer a slightly different uh, notation. We'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. And that's something called a differential, and that's what I'm showing at the bottom of this slide. And the differential is an operator, which is the thing that takes a vector and multiplies by the Jacobian. This is a very typical thing to do. So rather than having matrices in differential geometry, we tend to talk about operators. This is just complicated notation to get you guys confused. But essentially all it is is whenever we talk about an operator like a differential, it's just the thing that takes in a vector and gives you back the product of that vector and the, the Jacobian matrix. So this is a complicated way of encoding a Jacobian. And we'll see that schematically that's going to provide us with some sort of nice uh, way of describing certain things in, in geometry. Okay.
So just like we talked about curves as being sets of points, a manifold is also a set of points with certain properties. And now uh, we're equipped to uh, describe this formally. So a manifold is something that is locally Euclidean. So it locally looks like maybe k-dimensional space, but globally it's curved. And so in order to formalize that, with this crazy definition here, which is hard to read, but again, just look at the picture, that's gonna be okay for today. So a manifold is a set of points, so that around every point there exists a map, sorry, I guess this is an m-dimensional manifold, I'm sorry, I was using k before. Uh, there exists a map g into this manifold, where the derivative of g has full rank. So in other words, remember I have the Jacobian, it's like m by n, the dimensionality of the column rank or the row rank of that thing is equal to m. So if we go back to our definition of a curve, this is sort of a generalization, right? So this is exactly the same thing as like, you know, when I drive along the curve, my car can't stop. But now uh, you can't do that in any uh, direction. And the useful fact that, that is going to be particularly useful in manifold optimization is that level sets of a function are manifolds whenever the derivative of that function doesn't vanish. Hopefully we remember what a level set is, right? So like a level set would be a function from maybe the plane into the real numbers. Then the level set of that would be like the set of points where f of x equals one or c more generally. So we notate that as f inverse of c. And that thing is often a manifold. So every once in a while it'll like degenerate to a point. And you, de you can detect when that happens by looking at the derivatives of f. So this is just a very typical way that people check uh, whether something is a manifold. It comes from the uh, implicit function theorem, if you remember that. Okay. So the final object that we're going to need, and then we're going to go back to uh, machine learning optimization world, is something called a tangent space. There are many different ways to describe the tangent space of a manifold. I think we've all, we all kind of know how to think about tangents. Right? So if I have a surface, right, then the tangent is like the plane of vectors that touch the surface at one point. One nice way to formalize that is, let's say that I have a manifold, and now I draw a curve along that manifold. So I'm driving a car, and the car is driving along the surface. It can't leave the surface. And I look at the velocity of the car. And the velocity vector of the car is necessarily tangent to the manifold, right? Because if it were off of the manifold, the car would be jumping off of the surface, right? And so in differential geometry, actually a sneaky way to define the tangent plane is it's the set of all velocities of cars driving through a point. So it's like the, the you know, the, the, the gamma prime of zero, where gamma is a curve along the, uh, the manifold that hits the point P at time zero. This forms a vector space. Okay, of course, probably the, the, the definition that we're more used to seeing is that it's the image of the, uh, the Jacobian, right? So if I have a function that maps into the manifold and I take its derivative, then that gives me the tangent plane. Right, I think we've seen that in calculus. Okay. So remember that we talked about Riemannian geometry as kind of an interesting thing where we've decoupled the geometry of our domain from the geometry of our manifold. So it's sort of an optional advanced topic. In, in Riemann geometry, we add one additional thing, which was we give our, uh, our ant a way to measure the lengths of vectors. So think back to that example where I had the map of the, the world. Right, so at every point, what was the tangent plane? Well, it was actually just the, the plane of the, the, the map, right? But a vector drawn based at Mexico, the way that I measure the length of that vector is gonna be quite different from the way that I measure the length of a vector based at Antarctica, right? Because there's a much smaller amount of uh, geography up there, right? And so the way that Riemann encapsulated that is he said at every point P, I'm gonna have a dot product function, so that's what this notation is, which takes in two vectors and gives me back their dot product. And this can vary depending on where I am on the map, right? So in Mexico, it's probably a smaller weight because vectors are, uh, you know, take up less uh, space. Okay, so as, as a simple example of a Riemannian manifold, um, we mentioned this yesterday as well, there's something called the Poincaré disk. So this is a circle or, or a disk, right? The interior of a circle, but it's equipped with a weird version of dot product or if you're not used to reading this notation, it's okay. The key thing to, to notice is if you look at the denominator on the right-hand side, notice that it's one over one minus x squared minus y squared. So what happens as I move farther and farther 
toward the uh, outside of the circle, what happens to the, uh, the weight in front of dx squared and dy squared? It goes to zero, right? So I'm dividing by zero. So in other words, as I move farther to the outer points of the circle, vectors, what happens to my metric? Well, I have one over length there, right? So somehow they start to look longer, right? And so this is one way to formalize sort of the geometry of a hyperbolic space, like the potato chip that I'm showing you on the right, right? Because as I move farther out in the potato chip, there's more perimeter for the same amount of area. Yeah. That's sort of what's going on here. Okay. So anyway, in about 30 minutes or less, that's your introduction to uh, differential geometry. So now let's go back uh, to talking about uh, how we're going to make gradient descent work in this regime. Okay, so uh, remember our schematic here, we have uh, the gradient descent algorithm. We have two different ingredients that we need to talk about. One is gradient, the other is descent. Now we know what we're working with, which is we have a variable on a manifold. So we have to define what does it mean to take the gradient of a function on a manifold, and what does it mean to descend along that direction, okay? And so those are the two things we're going to do. So first let's talk about gradients. So what is a function on a manifold? Well, there are many different ways to think about it. One way to do it is to think about there being a color assigned to every point, right? Maybe it's scaled from blue to red. My goal is to find the most blue point on the manifold. So in that case, what is the, uh, the gradient of a function? So it's sort of like a vector field, right? It's the vector that's tangent to the manifold and points in the direction of steepest ascent, but constrained to be in the tangent space. Does that make sense? And so there are many different ways to define this. There's a very simple one, which is I take a neighborhood around every point of my manifold. Remember that by definition, around every point in my manifold, there exists a parameterization. There exists a map from Euclidean space into this, this thing that's bijective, right? So locally on my, uh, my bunny here, you know, I take a point on his ear somewhere, and I can map that to the plane, and I can transfer the colors from the, 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 the ear of the bunny into the plane. And I know how to compute the gradient of a function on the plane. That's not so hard, right? So I can compute the gradient of the plane, and then I can push it forward back onto the surface by just multiplying by the Jacobian of the map into the surface. So in other words, by, by putting it into that differential function that we talked about before. And this is where differentials are useful. So I have a local parameterization of my surface phi. So this is the thing that maps into the point P. I pull back my function. So now in some neighborhood, instead of thinking about this crazy curved object, I just have a function on, on Euclidean space. I know how to compute the gradient there. I put it into the differential of my function, and what comes out is a tangent vector to the surface, which is defined to be the gradient of the function on the manifold. This is sort of like, even if you're not used to this, it's actually somehow the most reasonable definition. Like if you sat down with pen and paper and you played with it for 15 minutes, you'd probably reach the same uh, definition. Okay, so that's the easy part. The harder part is how do you do descent in gradient descent? And the reason this is so tricky is that on a manifold, I can't walk in a straight line, right? I can't, there's no notion of subtraction anymore. And so instead of that, what I'm gonna need is an object known as the exponential map. And the exponential map is one of these crazy uh, pieces of notation from differential geometry that's really not so difficult. I'm using this phrase a lot today. Like, it looks complicated, but it's not so bad, I promise. Okay? So in particular, let's say that I'm standing at a point P on a surface, and now you give me a tangent vector V. Right? So a tangent vector, it's like a way to point my toes, standing at this point, and a length. So I can't walk in a straight line. There's no notion of straight line in, in curved geometry anymore. Sorry, welcome to the uh, non-Euclidean universe. But what I can do is I can take a measuring tape and I can measure a piece of measuring tape or a piece of string that's equal to the length of the vector v. Now I can take that piece of string and I can tack it into the floor right in front of me. And I can start walking in the direction v along my surface, holding the piece of string behind me. It's kind of a Hansel and Gretel scenario. And eventually, I'm walking, and the string becomes taut, and I stop, 
Right? So in other words, I trace out a geodesic curve, that's the fancy term here in geometry, nothing more than a shortest path on the surface. And the way that I do that is just by walking along a straight line. But it's a straight line locally. Globally, I might be tracing out, for example, a great arc on a sphere, right? Like a shortest path on a sphere. And that is what the exponential map is. It takes in a point, which is like the base, that's like where I pin my piece of string, and a tangent vector, and what it outputs is the point where I start at point P, I walk in the V direction, but along the manifold until I have traveled that distance. Okay? Uh, and, and so that's going to be our, our new kind of replacement for the descent step in gradient descent. All right? Unfortunately, there's a problem. There's always a problem. The problem, though, is that geodesics, right, these curves along surfaces with the prescribed length, they're really annoying to compute. They're often quite difficult to compute in practice, right? Um, and, and, and this is a well-known fact of differential geometry. In fact, they're non-unique. So, for instance, there's, here's a kind of a crazy example where, um, let's see, I stand at the yellow point, and I point in three different directions, and I walk long enough. I can actually end up at the same place at both of them. So geodesic curves have all kinds of weird properties that we're not used to thinking about on uh, Euclidean space. Right, like in Euclidean space, if I point my toes in two different directions and I start walking, I'll never like come back and find myself again. Right, that doesn't happen. Um, so it turns out that a weaker notion, that essentially in, in, in practice is quite difficult to compute these curves, um, but it turns out for, for gradient descent, all that matters is that for a little while you look like a geodesic and then you can start to wander away and it actually doesn't matter. And this makes sense. Like if you've ever read the uh, if you read the proof of convergence for gradient descent, you know, it's, it looks like calculus, right? It's using derivatives and kind of local arguments. It's not using anything global. So one thing you can convince yourself is that in gradient descent, if you actually step along a curve, and in gradient descent, as long as that curve locally is like the gradient direction and then it starts to bend, actually the, the convergence of gradient descent doesn't change. And, and somehow a similar phenomenon is happening here, that it's okay to not have the exponential map. You can just have an object called a retraction. And a retraction, it has the same notation as an exponential map, so there's a base point, xk, and a tangent vector. And essentially, it's any function that takes a base point and a tangent vector and gives you back, you know, another point on your manifold with the property that as that tangent vector scales to zero, this map differentially agrees with the exponential map. So locally, it looks like walking along a geodesic, and then globally, it can drift off and do something else. Okay. All right. Um, so let's see, I'm supposed to end at 12.30, so I think we'll skip uh, in the slides and in the handwritten notes, there's a way to extend this to Riemannian picture, but we'll talk about the embedded case instead, because I think it's more interesting. Okay, and that's it. So if you want to have your gradient descent to algorithm, it just looks like this, right? So now you take your gradient, you scale it by minus alpha times, uh, well, by minus alpha, right? That's like the uh, learning rate. And then you put that into your retraction, and the retraction guarantees that you move along your manifold. There are many different strategies uh, that extend this in different ways. So line search is sort of like the question of how do you choose how far along your, your geodesic you walk? Right, so the very simple one is just to take it to be one over k, or maybe even a constant. Um, or there are techniques like backtracking, which say like, if I go too far along the geodesic, maybe I kind of overshot my minimum, and then I want to like shrink it until my objective value decreases. Now there are other optimization algorithms than gradient. Yes. Yes. That's a great question. So, so to repeat the, the question here, um, in order to compute the gradient, we needed a local parameterization. We needed a map into the manifold. So why not use that thing as a retraction? Um, the answer is you often can. But uh, remember, the definition of a retraction requires um, a special property, which is that the derivative of the retraction looks like the identity matrix locally. It looks like geodesic. And that is not a condition that you need for your parameterization. Um, so there's, a, there's an additional condition that you have to check before you can do that. Okay. Um, one question you might ask, there are other optimization algorithms out there. One of them is Newton's method. 
Uh, I'll encourage you to take a look at Abziel's textbook for how to make Newton's method work on a curved manifold. I think it's largely of mathematical interest at this point. I think it's very difficult to make these things work in practice. It turns out that defining the gradient of a function on a manifold is not so hard. Defining the Hessian involves the curvature tensor, and then uh, stuff gets much more complicated. Um, another kind of interesting extension, by the way, is that um, a very popular idea in machine learning right now is convex optimization. Uh, and there's actually an extension of that notion on a curved manifold. This is called geodesic convexity. Um, and especially in negatively curved domains like potato chips, it turns out there's some very interesting things that you can do. Okay, so I thought I'd use our remaining time today to do at least one and hopefully two examples of uh, manifold valued optimization. So we'll start with an example on the sphere and then we'll do one in um, uh, 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 this more complicated space, the Stiefel manifold. Oops, wait, where's my uh, second page here? So the first thing I thought we'd do is just talk about the basic objects that we've, we've been defining in the special cases. So first of all, the unit sphere. I think we've all seen it before. It's a set of vectors whose norm is one. This is a manifold. We didn't actually check that, but it's easy to. Um, so what is the tangent space of a sphere? I think you can kind of guess it, right? So at a point P, the tangent space is actually all of the vectors that are orthogonal to P. Right, so the, the picture you should have in mind is that, you know, here's the point on my sphere, here's the tangent plane. Notice that these two things are orthogonal, right? Um, and so that's, that's a, a very easy way to compute the tangent space. So I want the gradient of a function along a sphere. Well, let's say that I have a function in all of extrinsic space. So I have a function on all of Rn, but I just want the gradient on the sphere, right? Well, when I take the gradient of my function, it might tell me that I should leave the surface of the sphere, right? And that's not okay. Because if I want to do manifold optimization, I don't know how to leave the surface of the sphere. I have to stay there. And so the correct notion of gradient, notice I've used this notation here where there's a subscript next to the gradient symbol, which is telling me the manifold. So there's kind of a funny notation. There's a gradient in Rn. That's the one that you guys are used to computing in TensorFlow. And then there's a gradient along the surface of the sphere. And how did I get from one to the other? I just projected out the component of the uh, gradient in Rn that is normal to the sphere, because that component is irrelevant to my problem, right? So this is actually turns out to be the correct notion of gradient. And then for retractions on the sphere, it turns out there's two very common choices. One is that on the sphere, you get very lucky. You can actually write down the exponential map in closed form. This is like the path of an airplane, right? It's the great arc, uh, and it looks, uh, Unsurprisingly, it looks like tracing out a circle. Right, so that's this force formula here. Um, or actually a very simple uh, uh, notion of a retraction, which is not a shortest path on a sphere, but it's still a retraction, is what I've shown you here, where I step off of the sphere, right? That's like P plus V. And then I just project back down, so I divide by its norm. Is this thing the shortest path on a sphere? No, right? I mean, if V is very large, like you won't loop around the sphere, right? You'll just like kind of asymptote. But one thing you can show is that for small v, it looks like the shortest path. Which is not entirely surprising, um, because it's sort of like the shortest path in 3D plus a projection. Yeah. Here's a more interesting example. So here's the, uh, the Stiefel manifold. This is a set of orthogonal vectors. This is actually a very common manifold for machine learning applications, because oftentimes you'd like to find like a low dimensional projection of your data. I think principal component analysis. Right, so in PCA, what is your variable? Well, it's a set of PCA directions, right? And what are your constraints? Well, it's that they're unit length and that they're orthogonal. So in other words, your set of PCA directions is itself on the Stiefel manifold, yeah? So one way to, to formalize the Stiefel manifold is this set of matrices that are n by k. So n is like the dimension of your data. k is like the number of PCA vectors. But they have to satisfy this constraint that x transpose x is the identity. This is saying that these vectors are orthogonal to each other and that they're unit length. What's the tangent space of this manifold? Well, this is a good excuse to do a computation. So let's see if we can switch to the, uh, the iPad here. This is, I'm nervous. Let's, we'll see if this works. So I plug that in there. Now we pray. Cool, 
Look at us. Yeah. I don't read Russian, so hopefully there's no expletives on the screen. Okay. All right. Let's check. Thanks. All right. So now we have the, uh, the set of uh, X. Wow. Yeah. This is much better than before, huh? Okay. Such that X transpose of X is equal to the identity. And remember that the tangent space of a manifold is like the velocity of a curve moving through that manifold. Yeah? So let's say that I have a curve. Oop. And it, that's okay. Oh, should, that's okay. So let's say that I have a curve uh, X of T. Like that. And now X of T has this property that X of T transpose times X of T is equal to the identity. And now let's take the derivative with respect to t. So by the product rule, what am I going to get? So let's call um, xi is equal to x prime of t. That's OK. Maybe I'll try this other app. So, so maybe other, maybe other. is equal to x prime of t. Yeah, so this is Cool. <laughs> so when I differentiate that relationship that was on the screen before our app died, then what I'm going to get is that xi transpose times x, oh, this one's weird, plus x transpose times xi is equal to zero, right? And so the tangent space of our manifold ah, at a particular uh, point x, hopefully this is read legible even if it's a little weird looking, um, is equal to the set of matrices xi so that this relationship is true. Okay? It's actually a pretty straightforward uh, manifold. Is that at all legible? It's also, this is why I sent you guys those handwritten notes that are in the PDF. Um, so you can take a look there. They are also uh, written uh, in that set. Okay? Um, this, uh, this manifold admits a nice retraction. Um, which is really beautiful. Uh, so the, the retraction here uh, is going to look like the, uh, the following. So let's see. Yeah, that's okay. So you want to cut to, to, to erase a lot? Oh, I was just, no, I was going to see if it was easier to, if there was a simpler pen that wasn't so sensitive. But this, this is fine. Don't, oh. Just like binary. Degrees, the size. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, not so easy. It's okay. Maybe this. Try this. Okay. Cool. Uh, not it's fabulous. So, um, okay. Does it work? You know, we can't, there no, no blackboards, huh? We can't, uh, <laughs> let's maybe just try the notes thing. We'll try one more time. Okay, so, uh, right, so we have this retraction. Remember, the retraction takes in a tangent vector and a point, which is on the Stiefel manifold, and that puts another point on the Stiefel manifold. So in this case, there's a really nice formula, x plus psi identity. minus one half. Now, this seems like kind of a crazy formula, <laughs> um, but there's two things that we have to check. <sighs> okay. Um, that's all right. Why don't we load up the, the, you know what, I'll just put it back on my laptop and load up that PDF and scroll. <laughs> Worth a try. Yeah, that's okay. Now I have to find the email that I sent. Sorry, guys. Um. Ah. We'll do the, uh, you know, like the Martha Stewart version, like when something is going wrong and she like pulls out something from the oven that's already made. Okay. So. <laughs>
Here's our retraction. Let me uh, project in a way where you can actually see my screen. What's that? No, I'm not going to do that. We're good. Thank you. Um, okay, so, uh, right. So here's our, our retraction formula, which is the one that I showed you guys before uh, on, the, on the screen here. And the two things that we have to check about our, our retraction. The first one is that it doesn't leave the manifold, because if it did, it wouldn't be valid. Uh, and the second is that it agrees with the exponential map locally. Right? So how do I check if this thing agrees with the, uh, is on the manifold? Well, remember that the manifold is, devi is, de is, is defined by the set where you know, x transpose x is equal to the identity. So now I plug this into the retraction. I have the, the rotation, or rather the retraction transpose times itself. And when we plug into um, algebra here, right? So remember, this is our formula for the retraction. On the right-hand side, here's this transpose. When I expand the square, I get x transpose x. What's x transpose x? Well, remember that x is on the manifold by definition. So what is x transpose x? It's the identity, right? That's the definition of the Stiefel manifold. Then I get these cross terms, right? X transpose xi plus xi transpose x. But that's zero by definition of the tangent space. And then finally, I get xi transpose xi. Right? So that's what this middle term is here. But notice that I have, right, the inverse square root is on either side. So when I multiply these three terms together, I get the identity matrix. Sneaky, huh? So in other words, I showed that I have a function that for any x and xi pair stays on the Stiefel manifold. And the other thing that I have to check is that it agrees with the exponential map. So in other words, if I have, let's say that I have xi of t now, this is like a tangent vector. Right? So remember what the exponential map does. Right? I point my toes in a direction, and then I have xi is, like the, is the distance and the direction that I'm going to walk along my manifold. So if I want to agree locally with the exponential map, then I start with xi equals zero. That's saying don't move. And I move a little differential amount, and I want that that looks like a geodesic curve. Right? So in order to get that, I take the derivative of a retraction with respect to t, where xi is a tangent vector, and it starts out as zero, and then it starts to move out. Right? And what do I find? Well, essentially, when you crank through the calculus, I'm not going to bother doing this because it's a little bit hard to see on the screen. Yes? No problem. Oh, I just wrote it down. So, yeah, we're, uh, we're doing this in kind of a backward way where I defined it, and now we're going back and checking that the properties are okay. Yeah. There's a great question, which is how on earth would I have guessed this? <laughs> um, it turns out that it took people about 100 years to guess the right formula here. But uh, you can kind of eyeball it by noticing, like, well, I want to stay on this manifold. I need to cancel out certain terms and stay symmetric, which is kind of why you end up conjugating with the square root there. Yeah. But it's not obvious. It's a great question. Yeah. OK. Um, right. So when I, when I differentiate the, uh, the retraction, one thing you'll find is that locally, it looks like just x plus xi prime. So in other words, just x plus the tangent vector a little bit. And one thing you can check is that that sort of map agrees with the, uh, the exponential map, which makes sense, right? Like somehow locally it looks Euclidean, which is what you want. OK, so, um, right, so there, there's our uh, example. No, that's okay. We only have five minutes anyway, so I don't know. the application is quite <laughs> Okay. Um, that's all right. I, I think uh, I appreciate it, though. Um, right. So I guess uh, in the notes that I've shared with you guys, uh, there uh, are, are, are two examples that I've worked out of, of some applications in the learning context. So maybe we'll talk about them a little bit at the high level. We can try and plug in here at the last second, but we'll only do that if we're done talking. Um, and and uh, uh, and then I'll let you uh, peruse those over lunch because we're a little bit late. Um, so the first example that we go through is Rayleigh quotient minimization. So what is the minimum of this function with respect to x when x is the unit length? Does anybody know? This is an eigenvector of a corresponding to the minimum eigenvalue. Uh, and so one of the kind of interesting things you can do is actually use these manifold optimization tools to come up with a new algorithm for computing eigenvalues. It's a little surprising why you might want to do this. In a, um, but but there, there are cases in machine learning where you don't actually care 
about getting a really, really precise eigenvector. You just want some approximate thing, like in PCA. Uh, and then it turns out that the Riemannian sort of analog of stochastic gradient descent is actually quite effective for, for this sort of a problem. Um, so essentially what we work out in the notes, maybe I'll even try and show it to you here. Oops, um, not that. Uh, this one. My graduate students use Overleaf so much that I have a different browser that I use for Overleaf and uh, everything else. Okay, so there's a very simple proof that shows that you get um, uh, the eigenvector problem if you do Lagrange multipliers. In order to compute the intrinsic gradient of this objective function, remember we already did that actually. It's just you take the gradient in Rn and you project out the component that's uh, normal to the sphere. And so that's this formula here. So if you want to derive a very simple first order algorithm for uh, Riemannian descent on this, uh, this X transpose AX, so the gradient of X transpose AX just in Rn is just nothing more than two times AX. That's easy to check. So the Riemannian gradient of this is this formula here, right? So essentially I just took the normal gradient and I projected out the normal component. So our first order algorithm is nothing more than computing that gradient and then plugging it into the retraction and iterating. One thing you'll notice is that like this algorithm almost looks like algorithms you might have seen for computing eigenvectors, right? Typically you multiply by the matrix and then you normalize. And you can actually recover that if you use the second thing, that retraction that we wrote down, right? Where remember there were two different retractions we had on the unit sphere. One of them was like cosine and sine and the other was add and then divide by the norm. If you put that second one in, then you'll get back eigenvalue iteration. If you put that first one in, you get some new eigenvalue algorithm that's just a little bit different and actually uh, has slightly faster convergence, uh, which is kind of surprising. Um, one of the applications that's suggested in Abzil's textbook that I thought was kind of clever um, is, is for refining an estimate of an eigenvalue. Sometimes you have an approximate eigenvector from these uh, iterative methods. Um, and maybe you like care about the fifth eigenvalue. You don't care about the first or the last. Well, you can still cook up an objective function which is minimized at any eigenvector. Um, and he does that in a sneaky way where he takes the gradient of f, right? So that's just like a times x. And he takes the norm of that thing squared. Remember the norm is zero at any eigenvector of our matrix A, right? So now we have an objective function which is minimized at any eigenvector rather than just the minimum eigenvalue. And so you can run the Riemannian uh, gradient descent algorithm here, and it gives you like a nice technique for taking an approximated eigenvector and making it better. So the other example, we're about out of time, but the other example that we do um, in these notes here, I'm sorry, it's hard to write down, uh, is the problem here. So this is on the Stiefel manifold. So remember that, again, this VK of Rn is the uh, sets of K vectors in Rn that are constrained to be orthonormal to each other, right? And so one thing you can do is you can actually write the principal component analysis problem in this language, and it's exactly what I've given you on the screen here. So like the columns of A are my data, Right, so X transpose A is like the dot product between my basis vectors and my data. Right, so then notice that this is a max now instead of a min. And essentially what I'm trying to do is to find the basis where if I project into that basis, I get the best dot product with my data. And it turns out this is exactly the same as the PCA problem. So that's derived in the, uh, the, the notes here. Yeah. So I, it's easy to prove using SVD. And the nice thing, and I think we'll, we'll conclude with this, is that one of the nice things that this allows you to do is to take the simple PCA problem and extend it in different ways. So for instance, maybe I want to do robust PCA, similar to the question we got yesterday. So every once in a while, one of my data points is garbage and I don't want to include it in my PCA problem. So in other words, I have that set of dot products with my basis vectors. And then what do I want to do? I want to take the L1 norm of the set of dot products which ends up leading to something called the mixed norm formulation, which is what uh, I provided here, where I take X transpose A, and then I take the norms of the columns not squared, and I sum them all together. This is a very common uh, model for robust PCA. Or uh, maybe I have a slightly different model where I want sparse PCA. I'd like my, my PCA vectors to not have too many non-zero entries. 
in which case the L1 norm should be on the entries of X rather than the entries of X transpose A. And so you can work through both of those. And the nice thing is that in the manifold optimization world, all of these are equally easy to optimize, right? I just compute the gradient of these things. Uh, and I use this predefined manops machinery, which is used to walk along this, this manifold. Uh, and, and it's really equally straightforward. Whereas the kind of standard algorithms for PCA break down, right? So um, this is sort of a nice technique for modeling and changing the PCA problem in different ways. Uh, and then uh, leading to different models with different levels of robustness. So in any event, I encourage you guys to take a look at the notes that I've shared with you. They work through the algebra quite carefully. They had to because I'm new to this area, so I have to do it quite carefully. Um, and and uh, yeah, so you can, you can get a feel for what it takes to do uh, computations in this manifold valued optimization world. Um, in addition, in the slides that I've shared, I've sh uh, shared some pointers to some other research papers that use these things. Here's a giant table of every single variation of PCA and where it appears in the manifold optimization literature. Um, this also appears in semi-definite programming, so the cone of matrices that are semi-definite is itself a nice manifold um, and, and with a nice exponential map. People use it for Netflix problem, synchronization, all kinds of good stuff. Um, and if you look at the repository associated to the ManOps library, you'll see there's this huge zoo of examples where they essentially take, it's kind of nice, you can take an entire research paper in machine learning and implement it in like five or six lines of code that way, just taking the gradient of the objective identifying the correct manifold and, and, and optimizing. So with that, I think I'm holding you guys from your lunch, so maybe we'll, we'll stop for, for there. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have now or, or maybe over lunch is, is probably uh, what we prefer. So, uh, Rodrigo, do you have uh, announcements? Well, actually, it's not lunch, it's the next lecture. Oh, <laughs> fabulous. All right, sorry. So, we have another lecture. <laughs> <laughs>